check, check, check. All right, we're good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with episode 28 of Zed Daily. I have Donkey Teeth from Zed Diamond Hands with us. How you doing, sir? Hey, thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited to talk uh, talk some horses. Hell yeah, man. I'm excited to have you on. So before we get into the digital horse racing, how did you get into crypto? Good question. Uh, you know, it was back in probably early 2017 when the... Uh, uh, I guess the first uh, real Bitcoin explosion happened. Uh, just um, friends, friends kind of pulled me in, and uh, you know, I started buying a bunch of random shit coins, <laughs> and uh, you know, some of them hit. I didn't didn't invest uh, a crazy. I wish I had invested more, um, but uh, yeah, I, I started kind of just learning everything that that I could about. Uh, Bitcoin and blockchain at that time and um, <clears throat> got into crypto Twitter, which, you know, I, I guess that's the biggest blessing is that, you know, that's the, that's how I found out about Zed run is just through those circles that I had um, started following during that 2017 boom. So when you got into crypto, I think kind of like most of us, you go to shit coins. Was it just because you wanted to get the gains or, that you hadn't fully understood like the power of Bitcoin at that point? Well, I, you know, I guess it's because of the, the run that Bitcoin had already been on, mm. uh, you know, coming from, I, I've always been, um, uh, you know, an investor in, in the markets and I've traded options for on and off for probably the past decade or so. So you know, the run that it had been on, it was one of those things that I didn't necessarily want to chase and was more interested in finding like the next one. Not that I, I mean, I did buy some Bitcoin um, and then I accumulated as it went down. But yeah, it was more like I, you know, everything's booming here. I got to try to find the, the next Bitcoin. And I did. I was fortunate enough to buy uh, a decent chunk of Ethereum, nice. you know, when it was like one hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. So uh, that worked out well. <laughs> Was that just kind of like a shotgun uh, shot to where you shot at a bunch of coins and Ethereum happened to be on there? Or was it more precise and you kind of did your research on Ethereum? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I think it was kind of even back in 2017, it was pretty uh, common knowledge that Ethereum was number two. And, you know, it had the second biggest network and, you know, all, all the smartest minds were working on uh, generally Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is why. You know, I think there's that, that argument for them to have the, the longevity that, that people talk about. But yeah, there was, you know, the other ones I shot like $100, $200 at so many of the small ones. And man, I wish I had put more in because like uh, Mana, the central land mm. was uh, one of them. And I put a hundred bucks in and it's worth like, I don't know, five grand now. If I had only thrown, you know, five grand at it, it'd be different. <laughs> so uh, we have a question in chat is where did you get the name Donkey Teeth? Yeah, you and I were kind of uh, chatting about this uh, before the the show. I I come from the fantasy sports world. I've uh, again I've been doing that for the better part of the the last decade, and um, you know it's actually from the the show Key and Peel. Uh, they do that East West Bowl skit, and that was one of the guys on there. And I just I you know I, I love that skit. I think their show is hilarious, and picked up the the name from there in a chat room, and it kind of grew from there. I started the podcast up. Uh, on fantasy baseball and moved into fantasy football and then I became a partner at a fantasy sports site and I've had this pen name uh, rasball.com is, is the site that, that I'm a partner in now uh, some people out there are in the fantasy sports where I know there's some crossover between Zed naturally and fantasy sports because of the gambling aspect um, but uh, yeah that I write there and podcast there and uh, manage a team of writers there awesome so you go from 2017 we're buying crypto how do we get from 2017 crypto to digital horses in Zed Run. Well, you know, I, I've uh, always been uh, kind of a, I wouldn't say a horse racing fanatic in real life, but I've, I've always enjoyed going to the track and OTB and placing some bets on horses. Um, yeah, I like gambling in general. I think most people in Zed probably have that in common. Uh, so when it popped up, I was in top shot as well. Uh, so I think there's a natural crossover there too, mm -hmm. but when Zed popped up on my Twitter stream, it was like, this looks interesting, you know, and, and the, as, as I started to dive into it and, uh, you know, kind of sponge information up about it, man, I got, I got excited because the, 
sky is the limit for what uh, what Zed can turn into if it's executed properly. So when you did your research, what stood out about Zed to you? Like, was it the entertainment aspect, the ownership aspect, the gambling aspect? What was like the the North Star for you in Zed Run? You know, I think what really, when I got in, uh, you know, Poseidon was um, doing a lot of YouTube streams at that time, uh, which was, you and I talked about this again before we, we started on the show. It was, it was early March and um, you know, I asked him a lot of questions. I, I've always been a person that, uh, I try to surround myself with people that are smarter than me <laughs> and try to absorb as much as I can from them. And it's pretty obvious looking at his stable at that time, the guy knew what he was doing, very intelligent. Um, and I just wanted to learn as much as I could from him at that time. And he talked a lot about, uh, the future of Zed and Doofy did as well. And, um, you know, the potential for they were, I mean, they were talking about this again, back in March, April, the potential for big sponsors coming in million dollar stakes races, that kind of stuff. And, you know, taking the, the, a decent chunk of the in real life horse racing market, the equivalent to how, you know, Bitcoin has, has kind of taken some of the, uh, gold market in, in uh, those kind of terms. And that just made so much sense to me. And uh, I mean, when you look at something, when you come from something like Top Shot, which, you know, as fun as it was, uh, you, you look at it, it's like, man, there's, uh, is it sustainable? Yeah, I, I get the, the, the argument that it's, you know, what utility do sports cards have? It's the, the same kind of thing. But when you've got something, it's just it's like night and day when you look at the the use case for a digital horse nft versus you know a moment uh and how much that took off uh it's like man the potential is just so sky high here with with something like zed run so that kind of stuff i think it's it's that idea of big sponsorship money coming in which we've already now seen uh start to to happen with the netflix stuff and and stella um that's what got me excited and so how do you feel now, now that we've seen all these big names come in and now that they're actually sponsoring, we had the Netflix race, we ha like we know we're going to have more of these in the future. How does that make you feel now, knowing that that was one of the reasons you got into the game? I mean, great. It, it feels great to see that start to come to fruition. Uh, obviously, yeah, we can all agree that there have been uh, plenty of road bumps over the past you know, how many months and, you know, it's one issue after another, but I think that's also to be expected. Uh, my biggest uh, issue with Zed, like, like many others is the communication aspect. You know, I think, I think it's, it's not that hard to look past a, a lot of these growing pains if they're communicating about it and explaining what's going on and keeping us that have really invested a lot of capital in this game and believe in it in the loop. And uh, we hadn't seen that until, uh, I think yesterday with the Sentinel stuff, when that communication came out, uh, you know, it sucks that that happened. Obviously nobody wanted to see something like that happen. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that's a huge positive that came out of it. They handled it really well. They, uh, released a very well thought out, um, response to it. And, um, it's exactly what I've wanted to see for so long. And I think so many others have so huge step in the right direction there. I mean, that's, that's honestly my biggest concern with, with Zed is like, come on guys, communication should not be that difficult. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And then when I saw that yesterday as well, it makes you feel good, right? It's like, maybe this is the step in the right direction from the communication of the way they handled it, the investigation, and then reimbursing everybody that even competed against those horses, like hats off to them. I told my mom about this and sh she's a, uh, She's always been skeptical about the longevity of Zed Run. I think Arbitrage said the same thing. But when I told her about that, it made her feel comfortable about Zed Run because it makes them look trustworthy, right? Yeah, and you know what? I'll, I can speak to that too. Uh, something that happened early on, and you know, I don't know if a lot of people know this. I, I made it uh, public knowledge when it happened back in... I guess it was late April, maybe early May. Uh, there, there were some bugs going on with 
uh, the old open sea was like a matic open sea and you would go to list a horse uh, and this didn't last very long it was maybe like a week or two week period that people were having this issue and it was intermittent you'd go to list a horse and when you were clicking to to list it for sale it could change which horse you were looking at mm. uh, and it was very easy to, to list the wrong horse for this short period of time and uh, it was actually after breeding open for like the first time in whatever it was, I, I guess it was April, it must have been mid April. Uh, I was on short sleep, I had stayed up way too late, I only slept a couple hours and I was listing all these horses for sale. And I accidentally because of this bug listed uh, an unraced unbred Z2 Genesis uh, for 0.16. And of course, it immediately sold, I didn't realize until you know, 15 minutes later, uh, you know, I'm going to list something else. I thought this one horse sold and it's still there. I'm like, what happened here? Like, I thought I sold this horse. And then I see that it was my Z2. And there's, you know, there's that moment of like dread, like, holy hell, you know, I just, I just gave away $10,000, you know, uh, I got over it pretty quick, to be honest, like hey, I've lost $10,000 before. It, it doesn't feel good, but uh, I thought it was just my mistake. And then I started, you know, okay, well, I got to move on here. You know, it's like, what, what can you do? You can't look back. And I start listing more horses shortly later. And then I see the bug happening and I'm like, oh man, this horse was the same color coat, pretty much very close. The name both started with a P and uh, this is what happened. And so I, I, I bring it up to you know Rod in uh, discord and we started DM and I explain what happened and it took a while. It kind of escalated it uh it was Maddox's fault you know it was polygon's fault i tried to to get some sort of um reimbursement from them i wanted them to to take some sort of responsibility you know it was partially my fault i should have seen it and i i did you know it wasn't like i was trying to blame anybody else for like it was their fault too you know there's two sides to it but um eventually it took about three weeks and eventually i got in contact with one of the founders rob and he said, Hey, I took a, I took a, a video um, recording of the bug in action too. And I helped Polygon to fix the issue too. Uh, so, you know, I thought that would get me some sort of goodwill with Polygon and they, mm. they, they didn't really, uh, they didn't really do anything for me. And, and eventually Rob was like, leave it with me, uh, you know, let me gather some information on this and I'll, I'll do you right. And about two days later, he hits me up and he's like, we're going to reimburse you for, it was like 3.6 ETH that I had paid for the horse. He's like, we're going to just do a one-time settlement payment. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's good with you. I was like, hell yeah. I mean, ETH had gone up like 50% since I, I bought the yeah. horse too. So it was like, it was amazing. And that was when I was all in uh, on Zad McMahon. They treat people right. You know, and, and anytime people start bashing the Z team in, in the general discord and I see it, uh, I try to, to kind of stick up for them while they do have the, those communication weaknesses. I mean, they did me right. And I'll never forget that. I, lo I love that they righted that wrong. And even if you go look in the white paper, it says like, we're going to make some mistakes. Like we're not perfect. There's going to be some growing pains along the way. We've felt that with a lot of the stuff, but it's nice to hear that you've had something uh, righted. And then a lot of people that with the Sentinel gate and all these other horses, they've had their wrongs righted. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have a, a lot of trust in, in these guys. So you're doing research on Poseidon and Doofy. What were the, some of the main takeaways you took? And then how did you, like, what horses did you go and buy after you listened to these guys? Was it Genesis horses? Like, what was your strategy coming into Zed Run after you did your research? Yeah, I mean, Poseidon, I, he, he was one of the first guys to, to realize how important odds were. And so it was, it was all about odds uh, back at, at that time, figuring out, you know, what's the threshold here? Because nobody really knew. I mean, it was like, is it is it a 12 odds horse? What you want? Is it 10 odds horse? Do you want sub 10? And really, it turns out you, you wanted like sub eight. <laughs> and, I, you know, for me, I, I think when you're building a stable I think the threshold needs needs to continually. I think you're trying to raise the bar uh, as you build your stable along. And so, you know, I bred a ton of horses when breeding opened up, and I tried to race them as quickly as I could and kind of churn through. The market was so good at that time that it's like you could do no wrong in in breeding. You know, just keep breeding and breeding, and you know, keep the best and sell 
sell the other ones for what you can get and rinse and repeat. So that was kind of my strategy at that time. And it did work out really well. I started to try to accumulate um, the best racers that I could, uh, particularly Genesis. Uh, and, you know, it just so happened that uh, at the price point I was looking at, I ended up with a, uh, quite a few really good Genesis uh, mares that can race. And it turns out they can breed really well. Okay, so it sounds like you got most of your horses off of secondary. So how are you going about looking? Well, we don't have odds anymore, so it's it'll be a different strategy for people listening to this. But how would you go about finding these racehorses? Were you just looking at Griffin odds or consistent odds over time? Well, I, I would say 50-50 secondary and drops. You know, I, I did well in the drops, too. Um, I bought a lot of finnies at the drops, and I bought uh, – I bought one Z1 uh, at one of the drops, and that turned out to be a, a really good uh, male breeder named Unyielding. I was just incredibly lucky that that I landed him at a drop. Um, so I, I, yeah, 50-50 uh, between drops, and it was very fortunate the drops. I, I have to admit, um, but yeah, looking looking at Griffin odds, one thing that was actually really helpful, and boy, I can't even remember what was the name of. Uh, zoomies was doing those rankings i don't know were you familiar with the zoomies site i heard of it but it wasn't around when i came in yeah i mean they weren't around that long but they the rankings kind of sucked at first <laughs> and they were very open to feedback and they refined their algorithm and very quickly it became uh useful and they had uh open c listings uh on their rankings and so it it actually there was a stretch of time a couple of weeks where i would just you know every couple of hours i would go onto that uh site and kind of scroll through their rankings and see you know if anything popped up within you know the top 500 ranked horses on there at a reasonable price i would buy it or place a bid on it uh so that that actually did me really well and unfortunately that site went away but um, yeah, I, I, you know, just looking for good racers, uh, based on odds that, that were better than what I had <laughs> was kind of very simplistic. There was no, there's no like mad scientist. Uh, I I'm not as smart as like an arbitrage. I'll tell you that. So would you be on the same side as arbitrage to saying our, uh, odds were too easy to discover a horse, especially a new one, if they're really good. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And uh, Poseidon actually brought this up, uh, you know, back in probably April or May. Uh, he did a stream on it. it was very controversial, uh, but it, it just, it, I, I think for the longevity of the game, odds were not good. They were too accurate. They gave you too much information. It made the game uh, too much of a, uh, you know adrenaline rush based on odds versus a discovery game right. I, I don't think that you know once once if, if it kept going on that trajectory where does this game end up it ends up with a bunch of horses that have really good odds really close together racing against each other in class one and you know just like passing passing money around there, i think there needs to be some sort of more discovery and strategy involved in it to make it profitable uh, for all of us, you know, and uh, more sustainable. I mean, uh, the end goal here, I think for all of us should be to grow this to the point where there's enough users, you know, we all work together to make this a positive community environment to draw more people in. And then sponsors are going to come in because of that user base. And we're going to be playing for sponsorship money, not each other's money. I think that that's what we all need to, to be working towards here. So um, yeah, kind of a tangent that, that I ran off on here and I don't remember actually what, what the original all question good. was. I do that all the time as well. It's all good. So we'll go, we'll go back to your drop horses. How'd you justify spending the money for a Z1? Like, just give me your thought process there when you're going and buying the Z1 horse. Boy, you know, this is, uh, actually, so the, I, I bought two Z2s at the, the first drop and that was, it was, um, kind of a tough justification. You know, I, uh, I, I looped my wife in on the, the, uh, the investment because it's like, shit, I'm going to spend, you know, $20,000 on digital horses here. I'm like totally aping in on this thing that, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. It, it seems legit to me, but I don't want to invest. Um, you know, it's, it's our money. Yeah. It's not just my money. So I would feel irresponsible if I had without kind of looping her in, but, um, 
yeah, I just, the more that I, I dove in on Zed and uh, uh, listened to intelligent people, it's like, man, this makes sense. And, and things are booming right now. It just seemed, seemed like a good investment. So those were the first Z2s that I bought. Uh, the Z1 was a different case. I think it was the Terra drop. Um, where the one where they had all the links where you, you were around for that, right? Mm -mm. No. Okay. So, th so there was a drop, um, and it, you know, there was a lot of drama with these drops over the, over the summer, uh, that just couldn't, couldn't get it right. You know, uh, I'm not going to say it's their fault, but you know, people are always trying to take advantage of the system and you want to try to get these horses into newer stables hands. Right. Um, so they did this one where, they released, I think they took like a snapshot of if you had a stable at this time, and then they gave you a link uh, for a particular wave. So everybody wasn't trying to compete uh, at the same time for all these horses. You get like a little bit better of a chance to, to go after them. And, and like one person can't buy up too many horses. Unfortunately, they made it so that the links were shareable. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like this link is attached to your stable. So and they came out and said, you know, you can share links. It's like, well, this kind of defeats the whole whole point. And it was like, it was like this weird, like moral dilemma, like, well, everybody else is going to be sharing links. Like, it's kind of stupid not to, like, we all want horses, right? So uh, I think most people ended up sharing links. One of the links was broken. And so like a lot of the drops, all, a lot of the, they called them different waves. A lot of these waves sold out and this one had a broken link that nobody could really access, but somehow some people got the link that actually worked. Uh, and I kind of came into that link and there was a bunch of Z ones sitting there after the drop and all the other ones had sold out and they were selling on the open market for over the drop price. And you can kind of see it on open sea. So I was like, man, it's kind of a low risk investment, uh, at least in the short term to, to buy a Z one here. Like I could race it. And if it's not good, I can probably sell it and get my money back out. And, uh, at that time there was a 10% discount code, like a referral code. And you could get it by sending, sending it to yourself, essentially, like start another stable. So I, uh, I used this 10% discount code and bought one of the Z1s uh, that were just kind of sitting there like 24 hours after the drop. And uh, then I was kind of sitting there. I'm like, man, they're still selling and there's still more here. I can sell this for a profit and buy another one. So I list it for sale. And uh, it sells and I go and use another 10% 10 10 discount code to buy another one. I profit like one ETH on it. And I don't know if this is kosher to, to be saying, but you know, it's, it's just NFTs. It's like it, everyone's trying to, to find an angle to take advantage of market inefficiencies. Um, so I did that. And then, then the thought comes to me is like, you know, I should race this one and see if it's any good. I mean, if it's a donkey, I can sell it again and buy another one. Uh, so I, this is, it was unyielding that I lucked into. It was the second one I bought uh, and I raced him and, you know, he pulled good odds and I, you know, I wasn't sure like how good he was, but he was good enough that I uh, didn't want to risk selling him and buying another one and ending up with a donkey. So I held on to him and man, am I fortunate that, that I did because this guy might be the best breeder in the game, best breeding Z1 male. And he's really opened up so many doors for me as far as uh, relationships, networking, partnerships in Zed. Um, I, I've worked really closely with Doofy and uh, Jack from Good Boy Racing uh, on Unyielding Breeds. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful that I ended up with that horse. But that long story short, uh, actually long story long, because I've gone on a, a while about how good. this all, all happened. It's a podcast. You can <laughs> uh, talk as long as you want. That's how, that's how I ended up with my uh, first Z1. I love that. So how'd you go about finding that this horse was a good breeder? Was it that people were coming to you wanting to breed with this horse? Like, how'd you start making all these connections and realizing that this horse was a good breeder? So I wanted to keep the, uh, you know, I think this is kind of a, uh, was a common uh, idea for a while, uh, kind of holding your bloodline in your stable uh, and protecting it, which I've kind of softened on uh, over the past couple of months because I think that there, there's more advantage to uh, making deals and partnerships and bringing other blood into your, your stable and, and you know genetic diversity or, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but at the time when I bred him the first time, I was like, you know, there was no minimums, right? Or the, yeah, there was minimums, but they were all like the, the buterin uh, minimums when breeding opened the second time. And that's when I bred unyielding 
for the first time. And I'm like, you know, I'll throw them in at like $700. It's well above the floor. Uh, I don't think anybody else is like going to try to snipe it right away. And I'll get, you know, my 50% discount uh, for breeding uh, with another stable, with another one of my stables and snag all three. So I throw them in there intending to grab all three. And of course I get sniped mm-hmm. and I look and I see that, oh, it's Doofy that sniped me. And he used uh, his like best Z1 female breeder of vast sensibility. And I was like, well, you know, if, if you're going to get sniped by somebody, at least it's a good horse. My, my goal was to protect this bloodline and, uh, you know, breed only my best female uh, mares into unyielding and, you know, make them look like a really good breeder. Uh, so that I could charge higher stud fees down the line. Like at least, you know, at least somebody didn't breed a donkey with my Z1 was kind of how I thought about it. Turns out that uh, that offspring ended up being a really good racer by the name of Total Annihilation. And Doofy was very happy with it. And, you know, I followed Doofy's streams at that time uh, pretty closely. And he started talking about Toto and one of them. And I was in the chat room. I'm like, hey, you know, I own the, the sire on yielding and, you know, I think he had six offspring on yielding did at that time. And they were all positive, uh, ROI. They were, there were no donkeys in there, which wow. is pretty rare for a, a Z one or a Z two stud there. There just seems to be <laughs> call it what you want mutation or whatever. Uh, but it, it's rare that you sift through a Genesis Knox, uh, offspring and don't see at least a couple donkeys uh, sitting in there because they, they seem to mutate so much. Uh, when you breed them, there's just so much upside and so much they, they fall far from the tree typically, um, or they can. So he's been very consistent and you just don't see that very often. And I was pretty confident that he was a very good breeder just based on that, that small sample and Doofy was buying in too, because he had the best offspring and, uh, you know, he's looked at a lot of horses as well, and you just don't see it that often. So we ended up uh, talking on Discord about, uh, you know, making a, making some sort of a deal where he took all of the breeds and, you know, it was mutually beneficial. I, re- I really wanted a Ducky Malin offspring. Mm. So we talked about it for a while and uh, eventually came to a deal where I ended up getting a Ducky offspring and another uh, legendary uh, knock offspring from the deal. Uh, which also turned out to be really good. And all, all of the offspring, he just kept kicking out winners. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you look at, at Unyielding's uh, family tree, it's just ridiculous. There, I mean, there's like one donkey uh, in there and it's, you can tell that it, it's still got the base ability. Uh, it's still going to be a really good breeder. Um, so that's kind of uh, the story of uh, how, of Unyielding and, and how, he got me in the door with a lot of these other stables. Awesome. I love that a horse that uh, has certain abilities, either racing abilities or breeding abilities, allows you to network. And now you can meet some more people. And now you have that connection in the future to where maybe you and Doof, well, I see you and Doofy do the auction. So, like, I'm sure without unyielding distance, you don't get to that auctions point, right? So it's pretty cool that a breeding horse will lead to that kind of relationship, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, I've made a lot of, a lot of friends because of unyielding. That's awesome. So you have a guy like arbitrage come on yesterday and he says that you are the best breeder in the game. How do you go from one single horse to being called the best breeder in the game? Are you getting the blood tool? What are you doing different? And what do you have that makes your, your breed stand out? Well, I don't know if he said best breeder and maybe one of the best breeders I've been very fortunate. And I, I went on the uh, uh, Zed Gazette's uh, Twitter spaces yesterday and talked a bit about this. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to present myself as some sort of expert because I don't think that I am. Um, I think I've been very fortunate. Uh, I got lucky with uh, getting on yielding at a drop. I got also lucky buying another z1 stud by the name of minted molly who i'm starting to think might be better than unyielding which is just crazy to say like i I, somehow i've lucked into two of the best breeding z1 studs in the game and then i also at uh the first drop uh that april 2nd drop i bought a z7 uh philly by the name of peach for hours and if you pull up this horse's family tree it's i think it's the most ridiculous thing in zed um, she's bred triumph for hours, which you're familiar with. Uh, she bred a horse by the name of shadow for hours, which was one of my first great breeds. Uh, unfortunately, I think she might've been nerfed. I'm not, I'm not sure. She has not been performing recently, but 
uh, she won a, a $500 entry um, at like 1600 or something like that a couple months ago. And she was just a, a, a machine in, in class one. Um, and she has produced good offspring as well. You might be familiar with Shadow for Days, mm -hmm. who I put into both of those Netflix races. She's won a couple of the, the $500 entry races. And um, she kind of has, uh, to a certain degree, uh, like your diamonds, that, that kind of range where I can, I can throw her in any class one race between 1,000 and 2,000 meters. And I know that, that she's got a chance to win if, if uh, she lands on the right side of the U. Um, but yeah, all these monsters are coming from this, this family tree. So I got three just incredible breeders. It's like when you, when you keep breeding them with, uh, Genesis knock blood, it's, it's almost like you can do no wrong. And I started accumulating that when breeding fees were low. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the stud farm, just waiting for people to throw in reasonably priced uh, Z ones and Z twos and, and snagging them where I could. And it, it adds up, you know, it's, to a certain extent, a numbers game that if you, you just keep shooting, you're going to hit some. And then once you do hit some, those genetics are there in that offspring and they're going to have, uh, you know, a, a decent hit rate if you keep breeding those with, with more Genesis knock. So, uh, you know, the secret to me really is breeding with Z1 and Z2 Genesis in the stud farm. Of course, that's not feasible for a lot of people. It is costly. Uh, I've, pumped a lot of money into breeding. Uh, I've got a lot of experience. I've bred a lot of donkeys. Uh, but again, you, you just keep shooting, you're going to hit some if you can, if you've got enough of a bankroll build up where you can just keep breeding. It was much easier, you know, uh, over the, the summer when the resale market was booming, you know, the risk wasn't that high, you were able to, to breed them and you know, if they didn't match the threshold for your stable, sell them off and kind of, like I said, rinse and repeat at that time. But uh, that's kind of how I've gotten to the point where, you know, it was luck coming in, but it's no longer luck because I, I know I've got the right pieces. I, I know I just breed them with Genesis Nakamoto and, you know, eventually they're going to hit as costly as it, as it is. Um, yeah. I think that, that, that kind of sums it up. So it's, it's uh there's not really a secret to it. I mean, I guess the secret, which is no longer a secret, is looking for high base ability horses. Now, all, all Z1s and Z2s are going to have a pretty high level of base ability. I guess the piece that people probably are curious about is how to how to determine base ability. There's, there's now sites out there that kind of analyze it. And um, you, know, I, you did mention the blood tool. I don't have the blood tool, uh, but I've heard lots of, I mean, uh, a good portion of my friends do have it and, and say only good things about it. It's just like, at this point, I don't really need it because it's like, I know what I, what I'm doing and what to look for. So, and I have such good pieces that it's like, yeah, I'm sure that it would be helpful, but I don't, don't feel the, the need at this time to pay for the blood tool. Um, but the way that I look for uh, breeding partners is, uh, you know, a telltale sign of high base ability is the finishing positions of the horses. Um, so if they're finishing in the top half consistently in class one, that's going to be a pretty high base ability horse. You know, there's three pieces. Again, I don't think any of this is like secret, uh, but there's three, three things that make a, a horse, a distance preference, variance or deviation and base ability. And all that's getting passed down in the current uh, breeding algorithm, which might change, I hope that it does change because it, it doesn't leave a lot of uh, strategy right now. It, the base ability is what's getting passed down, and then you know it, it randomizes the the variation, the variance, the deviation, whatever whatever you want to call it, and the the distance preference. So if you've got two high base ability horses and you keep mashing them together, then you've got one of the three pieces, and you're just looking to get lucky on on the variance and the uh, distance preference pieces. Um, so to determine base ability, I, I look at the finishing positions of, of these horses. And again, you got to look at a lot of them, uh, to really figure out what is a really high base ability, uh, Genesis Z1 and Z2, because they're, they're all pretty good, you know? And so which ones are worth paying up, uh, you know, an extra amount to give you a, a little extra shot. Um, so you want to try to take out uh, the reason on yielding to me is so great is because he doesn't have any variance. And you can tell that because he's not finishing 
at the back end. Uh, and he's not winning a ton. He'll win some, uh, but there's a lot of second and third places, uh, a lot of fourths. There's not a lot past like seventh place. And, and this is even when you put him in class one paid races. Uh, so you can kind of tell there's not a lot of variance there. So it makes it easier to see the base ability. And then if you take out, if you look at just mid distance races, 1400 to 1800, then you're taking out that distance preference. You're taking out the sprints and, and the long distance races. So you're kind of isolating that base ability by doing that. Um, so it, that's not to say if you've got a high variance horse or a strong distance preference, it doesn't have high base ability. It's just tougher to tell. Uh, which makes it a little bit riskier breed. Um, so I guess if there was, uh, you know, a secret piece, I guess that would be what it is. But I think that that's becoming kind of common knowledge as well. Gotcha. So I was going to ask you uh, what type of horse is your favorite, but I think you answered that. I was going to ask you, is a variance, a distance preference, or just a high base ability horse your favorite? It sounds like a high base ability horse is your favorite because those would be the best breeders and they're just far less skewed on the racing. Yeah, I mean, my favorite is high base ability, high variance, mm. high distance preference, right? Go. That's the best of both worlds, <laughs> right. but it's also hard to tell. It's it's hard to tell what the base ability is when you get a great distance preference variance horse. Like, a, you know, I guess Diamonds doesn't have that strong of a distance preference, but the variance is so high. It's like, how do you tell what is the actual base ability here? And there's there's a lot of those horses out there, which, you know, it's worth breeding them and and building a sample to see. Um, but yeah, as in terms of finding breeding partners, um, I think that it's, uh, the risk is lower. Um, if you just find ones that don't have the strong distance preference and variance. So when you come and breed with a Z one, are you just looking at, uh, the, the racing or do you have a combination that you like? Do you like to bring Z, uh, like Z sevens and plug those into Z one Z nines, plug those into Z ones. Like what's your favorite type of combination when you're breeding with a Z one? You know, I was talking about to uh, Kevin from Arbitrage about this yesterday, actually, uh, because I've had so much so much success breeding Finny Genesis Finny mares into uh, Z ones and Z twos. Uh, I think the hit rate, the risk reward, and hit rate are maybe best doing that, but it's it's hard to say for sure because the resale value when you do miss is not there. Mm. Um, but I think that I think the hit rate is higher than if you're breeding like another Z1 or Z2 Genesis into a Z1. Um, the upside, though, I think we got to say the upside is highest if you're breeding two Z1s together at this point. Um, it's hard to deny that when you look at the, the best bred uh, horses out there. I mean, yeah, you've got the Crimson Chin. You've got Triumph for Hours. I know there's a handful of others that aren't legendary Z2, legendary Z3, but um, if you, I think if you look through the the best bred horses out there, there's a lot of legendary Nakamoto's, and uh, you know there's a lot of downside in breeding uh, two Z1s together or two Z2s or, or whatever. Uh, but I, I guess th those are my two preferences: uh, breeding legendary uh, two Genesis Nakamoto's together or uh, a good Genesis female Finney into a Z1 or Z2 Genesis. I think that those are, are the two best combinations that I found, but this could also be anecdotal. Like these are just the, the good pieces that I had to, to, to work with and what I've seen. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, a data guy. I, I, I've, I kind of go off of feel and my own experience. So I, that's kind of all that I can speak to. I, I have talked with uh, plenty of people that, that do have data about this kind of base ability. Um, it's not even a theory anymore. It's fact. Like this is, this is how it's working right now. Um, but I do want to say also that uh, I think that it's important that we don't get tunnel vision and focus on the way it is right now, because I do think that they're going to tweak it. I think they need to tweak it. Um, I think they know that as well, that they, they've, they've said they're probably going to add distance preference in. Um, so that changes the game. Uh, I hope they don't tweak it too much too quick. And they, they really make subtle tweaks and see what the effect is, because obviously we, none of us want uh, suddenly all of our good horses to be devalued because breeding becomes a lot easier. Right. And then if you change that, are you changing all the previous offspring from 
from all these horses that were bred? Like, could those possibly now have the distance preference? Do you think? No, I, I don't think that they would do that. I don't think, cause that would, that would, that would, that would require a rebreeding essentially. They would have to like rerun those breeds. I don't think that they're going to do, I think there would be a mass uh, outrage if that happened. Um, I think it will be, they, I mean, they might be doing it right now for all we know, they might be making tweaks to the breeding algorithm. It's not the same as, as tweaking the uh, racing algorithm. Uh, you tweak the racing algorithm, which is why people have, you know, if there's been uproar about it, mm. that changes the value of your horses that you already have. Uh, you change the breeding algorithm, that's only changing future bred horses. And that's the part of the game that, that I think that there's uh, the most um, potential to, for them to work with to change the ecosystem, the market, uh, and really improve things. Because, you know, right now it's, it's nonsensical to try to breed two exclusives together, at least, you know, breeding like uh, into a, a Nakamoto exclusive. If you're breeding in stable, yeah, it might be worth the shot because you're getting that discount. But still, I mean, you look at like the, the difference in price between breeding into an exclusive Nakamoto stud and a Genesis, like you, you can find Genesis Z2s at the min all day right now. It's like, do you really want for a 50% instable discount? I, I mean, I guess if you've got a monster that you know has high base ability at the exclusive level and it's like a Z3, yeah, maybe it makes sense. But um, right now it's just, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense the way that the price rungs work. There should be a bigger gap between breeding with a Genesis, a legendary, an exclusive, an elite. There's just no incentive to, to go below Genesis for, for me right now. Do you have like any prices that you would like to see? Like what, how would you bracket it? I haven't really considered uh, the exact price. I guess just spitballing here. What, what are we at? Like 350 minimum for Genesis Nakamoto. Something I think like I'd that. like to see it drop to, uh, you know, maybe like 220 for legendary and then like 160 for exclusive and then like 120 for elite or something like that, because it's, it's such a long shot right now breeding into um, even legendaries. Like I just am not having much luck breeding a legend, like a, a real, I know this, this Z2 female uh, legendary has high base ability. And I know this Z2 male has high base ability. I breed them together. You'd think that there would be a decent hit right there on that Z4 exclusive coming from some really good blood and base ability. And it's like, it's just really low hit rate. Uh, I am not having success and it makes me hesitant. To, like, it's like, I got to breed these horses. The the blood is so good. And the base ability is so good. I got to imagine they're going to hit eventually and I get the 50% discount. So it's like, I got to keep doing it, but man, how much money am I going to sink into it when, uh, you know, they, they keep missing. Right. I, I'm kind of on that same path. I have two Z2 legendaries and I'm printing Z4s every month. I haven't really got anything good but i know and i'm sure you know once you get that one horse you could probably it make up for, for all, all the rest exactly right yeah so where do you come up yeah. with these four hours and four days names like where do you where'd you get that theme from on your horses oh well, yeah like i told you that they all come from that peach for hours uh z7 genesis mm -hmm. so um yeah anything that's come to, I, I try to build a brand on it because the first time i bred that uh shadow for hours which came from shadow lawn a Z1 and Peach for hours, and it was a really good horse. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try to try to breed some more for hours horses, and I want to have all these awesome for hours horses running around the track. And then, you know, I kind of ran out of for hours names, so I started going for days, and then for years, and for months, and for minutes and seconds. So, uh, yeah, if you see those horses running around and they're kicking your ass, they're they're all coming from Peach for hours, which is just incredible. And uh, if you haven't looked at that family tree, pull it up and take a look at peach for hours because it's just unbelievable. I don't think there's another bloodline in Zed that has been so successful. Part of it is that I've only bred her with, uh, I won't say only almost only bred her with Z ones. Uh, so I have curated that bloodline very carefully and, you know, I have tried to find the highest base abilities. Some of those have missed, but uh, man, it's, it's incredible how, uh, the grandchildren are even really good, like Shadow for Days. And then Shadow for Days even has some solid offspring. No class one champions, but 
I mean, these are all profitable horses that it's, you just don't see that. What's your favorite horse that you bred? And what was the story of you discovering it? How did you figure out it was a good racer? What distance? And then why? what's the biggest buy-in you put it in? Oh, man. Um, well, I mean, it, it's it's narrowed to for sure. Uh, Shadow for Days it is a very fun horse. Um, and that one, I put in the two Netflix races. But I think the answer actually is Triumph for Hours. It's It's got to be. I mean, this horse... It's, I think, you know, I don't want to disrespect anybody else, but I think it's the best 2,600 meter horse in the game. Um, it's, it's raced in three $500 entries in class one. It's one, two of them. And it took second in another. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good track record in high stakes class one. Um, so funny story here. And I've actually been, been talking to, to GVG, uh, over the past 24 hours because he was in the, the, uh, Twitter spaces. And I kind of, uh, uh, shouted out to him in there. I'm like, Hey, hit me up. Like we've been trying, I've been trying to work some deals with GVG on breeding and we had talked about it and he's a busy man and he's hard to, hard to pin down. So he put glorious triumph into stud at like 0.6 ETH. And this was, this was when things were booming, you know, and that didn't seem like a, uh, it seemed like a good price to be honest, because glorious triumph, very high base ability, good track record as a breeder. Uh, I knew this horse was a monster. And I don't know if he put it in at that price intending to take it, uh, take all three breeds himself, because it, it really was not an outrageous price at, at that time. And um, so I saw Glorious Triumph pop into stud and I'm like, shit, 0.6. I got to I got to take at least one of these. So I try to take it and it errors. You know, it was back when breeding was having a, a bunch of errors. I don't know mm. if um, <laughs> if you were there at this time, but it was it was a mess. It was constantly you didn't know if breeding was going to work or not from day to day. And so I'm thinking, like, is GVG sitting there trying to, to take these breeds and he can't either. Uh, so I stay up uh, into the early hours of the morning, just kind of checking and checking if I could breed with Glorious Triumph. And eventually I got one to go through with my uh legendary z2 mare by the name of jaded who has had a decent track record and then i'm like well you know what let me try to take another one and uh so i i bred peach for hours with glorious triumph and i actually ended up taking a third one i, I bred shadow for hours into mm -hmm. glorious triumph so i took all three of them i spent 1.80 <laughs> it was an expensive night um and i didn't know for a long time how good uh triumph for hours was i I thought that she was a mid I raced her for the longest time. I won't say for the longest time because I kind of, I wasn't sure how good she was. And she started out so well at 1600, 1800, 2000 that I was almost kind of like leaving her be because it was like 50% win rate through mm -hmm. like 20 races. It's like, there's not a lot of other horses that are putting these kind of numbers up. Like the value of just having that showing to me at that time, uh, was very high. So I was like, I didn't really want to mess with it. I didn't know how good she was, uh, in retrospect, very stupid of myself, um, uh, because she actually turned out to be a distance horse and, uh, one of the best in the game. But I, yeah, that first tournament, the inaugural tournament, I tried to qualify triumph for hours at mid uh -huh. and did not. And if I had gone long distance, it, I mean, there's no way that she wouldn't have qualified and she would have been a legit contender, you know? So, uh, lesson to learn there. It was right after that. I was like, you know, I should probably, I should probably toss her in a 2400. And then she pulled flames against some good horses. And then, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history, but that was actually when, when, uh, Kevin from arbitrage and I started talking, you know, he, he made me an offer for her. I was like, you know, I, I don't think I want to sell right now. I'd like to see her against some of the best class one horses in long distance races because she hasn't gotten up there yet. And he, and he kind of threw out there that he'd be open to, to buying half and managing her. And so I, you know, I kind of was kicking it around. I had never made partnerships with people before in that form. I mean, it takes a lot of trust mm. to, to get into bed with this type of stuff with, with somebody. And I, I, I've been hesitant for a while to make joint purchases or anything like that. Um, but that got my, my, uh, head going on, on partnerships. And it, it kind of led us down the road that we ended up at here. So how'd you guys get to arbitrage hands? Was it, I, I asked him and he said that you guys were kind of both looking at Festus and then you guys just kind of said, let's join together. What's the story of you guys teaming up and what's your guys' plans for the future? 
Yeah. So uh, like I said, it started with Triumph, this idea uh, that he floated about buying half of Triumph for hours and managing her. And it just got me brainstorming because I've got so many horses that I just can't manage them all. And I know that they're profitable and, you know, I don't even, I just don't have the desire to, to uh, spend the time on racing, you know, breeding. I've spent a lot of time figuring out breeding and that's kind of, I, I like racing in high stakes class one. That's, that's what is enjoyable to me. I don't, I just don't have the mindset. They're so good at what they do at arbitrage. And there's other people that are very good at this as, as well. Finding the right place for horses in the, the racing uh, landscape and where they're going to be most profitable and just hammering it home there. And I have so much faith in, in, from talking to, to Kevin and getting to, to know him over the past I don't know how many months that no matter what changes come to racing, uh, they're going to be able to adapt and they're probably going to be the first ones to find the most profitable uh, place in the, the racing landscape. So it's like, the more I thought about it, it's like, I've got all these horses. They're not as valuable in my hands as they would be in somebody like his. Um, and I know that I'm only going to have more, you know, it's only a matter of time before, I land another, you know, triumph for hours or shadow for day. Like I've already got, uh, I've already bred, I don't know, four or five monsters. And then another probably 20, like really profitable horses that can hang in class one. It's kind of crazy to be honest. Uh, but more are going to be coming. And I think that that's kind of what enticed Kevin when I, you know, when I look at building a, uh, some sort of partnership to me, it's all about finding, uh, an angle that's mutually beneficial and incentivizes, I do well, you do well. You know, if both people are looking at it that way, then that's the best kind of uh, partnership that has some sort of synergy and incentivizes us to help each other and share what we know. And, um, you know, that, that was kind of the angle that I approached that. And I wanted to know what would make sense to him, because this is the way that I'm looking at it. Like I've got all these horses and they're better off with you. And if I can still own 50% of them and, you know, basically start collecting revenue, on them and then cut you in on future breeds at a, a discounted price. Um, I think that that was kind of the best of both worlds. And I think it's going to work out really well. I, you know, like I said, that they're, they're so smart. They're so much smarter than me. I'm lucky. They're smart. So on your side, you guys have got Evergreen Gates, Festus and Ray Del Mundo. Which one of those horses are you most excited to test out on breeding? Oh, definitely Evergreen Gates because it's a Z3 legendary female. Uh, that I think has really high base ability. Um, it's, you know, there's definitely some variance there, so it's, it's hard to tell how good again. Uh, but yeah, you know, Festus is a, is a male exclusive. We've already kind of hit on that. Uh, I'm not, not super excited uh, about breeding um, the males. You know, it's, to me, it's all about finding high base ability females because you can find high base ability males in the stud farm. Or if you've got if you've got a female that entices other people, you can make deals. You know, you can go to somebody that has, say, a glorious triumph potentially and say, hey, let's do let's do this breed twice. You get one. I get one kind of a thing, which I've done a ton with uh, unyielding and my other Z1 male minted Molly. So, yeah, in terms of breeding, that's uh, I think that's the one that, that I'm most excited about. I love that. That's cool that you guys are kind of partnering up and you got like the racer, you letting him do his thing and then you can come in on the breeding side and do your thing. And then we'll see what you guys create, a, create out of that. Well, yeah, not only that, I mean, he hit on this uh, when you guys were talking yesterday, I caught a bit of it, but uh, you know, I think that there, there is uh, a desire to make it clear that we still have our own identities as stables. You know um, this is kind of a side project and our own stables still are going to come first. We're just kind of working together on this other joint venture. And as I breed um, new horses, you know, I'm naturally going to keep him in the loop and he's going to be keeping an eye on them. And if one catches his eye, you know, I'm totally open to selling them 50% at a very friendly price, get this thing into their hands early. So I don't fuck it up. <laughs> And they maximize profits, you know, so that's kind of the, the, the uh, idea. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure that we're going to see other people starting to, to do this type of stuff because it just makes too much sense. How does a guy like wag me coming in, make you step your game up? Man, I, I love wag me. I've, 
I've gotten to know Wagme pretty well um, because I sold Forever New to him. I don't know if you knew that, uh, but that was their first really big purchase. You know, they had, they aped in obviously, and they, they bought, um, I want to say maybe like Music City. Uh, they probably paid 12 ETH for or something like that. Uh, they made some, some, some big purchases before they bought Forever New, but that was the first real big one. And um, so, I, you, you know, once that, that deal went through, we stayed in touch. And I mean, Wagme is so good for the game. Um, the injection of liquidity that he's put in. I, I mean, he may have single, I, I keep saying he, because it is two brothers. I don't know. I'm sure that they're fine with me uh, saying this. Uh, but what I had talked to one of them uh, that handles their discord and um, yeah, th- th- it's just like th- that liquidity that they've put into the game and their confidence in the game it goes a long ways. And it has this, uh, you know, I-, I call it the the trickle down wag me effect because the liquidity that they've given to other stables that still obviously believe in Zed uh, they reinvest uh, in other places in Zed and it boosts everything. And, um, you know, they're kind of setting market prices. I, I know people think that a lot of these um, the buys that they're making are kind of outrageous. And I honestly, I beg to differ. I think that like I sold forever new to them for 27 ETH, I think it was. And um, I, I would not make that sale. Uh, honest to God, I would not sell Forever New for 27 ETH if I didn't know that I could go turn around and invest that 27 ETH back into this market that I see as a down market right now. Um, I think Forever New is going to be a million dollar horse one day, uh, maybe not that long into the future. Um, that's just the way that, that I look at th- this game long term. I think that, that uh, the potential is so high for great racing uh, Genesis Z1s and Z2s and obviously wag me has that same kind of approach to it. So, uh, yeah, I think that they're, they're very intelligent and, uh, you know, say what you will about the, the, the prices that they've paid for their buys. Um, I, you know, I said this to wag me, I mean, people, who cares if people criticize, who cares if you paid five ETH too much, if your horse is worth a, a million dollars in, you know, six to 12 months, like who's going to care that you paid. It's like pennies really in, in the, the grand scheme. Uh, if it plays out the way that, I think we expect it to. Yeah. Of course, there's no guarantees. I think with the community, that's probably one of the biggest signs that this is going to play out. Then the game itself, and then the like guys like Wag Me, and then you got Perry on Dow coming in and buying these horses. But I wholeheartedly agree. Honestly, I think people letting these horses go for these prices is selling Bitcoin at like $9,000. People don't realize what they have and like the, the real potential of what their horse could have been or what it really will go for five years from now. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to criticize somebody for, you know, say you bought, yeah, say you bought Bitcoin at $500 and sold it at 9,000. It's tough to criticize that, but yeah, you, I I think that from my point of view, uh, you sure don't want to sell all out of your Bitcoin, you know, (laughs) if, uh, and, and, and use that analogy in, in Zed. I, I mean, if you sell and take some profits, I would at least look at putting uh, part of that uh, back to work in Zed in some form. Uh, you know, not not financial advice, as they say. It's just like, man, like you could sell a horse like that, but you never know when they're going to have this million dollar race. And if you have a horse that can compete in that race, to me personally, why sell it when you know you got a shot? Because if you can win that race, anything can happen. You're going to get a million dollars and you're going to keep the damn horse. It's a win win. And now you still have the horse to race some more. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody's got their own situations and uh, uh, you know, right. the reasons people do what they do can be motivated by a lot of different reasons. And I, I guess it's not for us to, to necessarily uh, judge that, but I do agree. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. I hundred percent agree. Um, how much hours are you putting into this game a day? <sighs> like 24. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, it's definitely a, an obsession and addiction and it's at times not healthy. Um, I think a, a lot of people listening probably have similar experience where it just kind of takes over your life. And, uh, you know, I see it having negative effects <laughs> in places and I, you know, I, I have a, um, a 
background of uh, a lot of meditation and introspection. So it's, it's, I, it's hard for me uh, to keep my balance when I've become like so obsessed, like I, I'm very self-aware and I see it happening, but I just enjoy it so much. And I see such a bright future that I also don't want to step back too far. So um, yeah, for me, it's very difficult finding that balance right now because I, I, I love Zed Run. I really do. And um, it's become literally a full-time job for me. Uh, I'd still do, again, I'm in the, the fantasy sports industry and I have like a very, very part-time job uh, in the business world that I've kind of, you know, got my foot out the door a couple of years ago and been working less and less and less. And th this has provided me uh, you know, another source of income, uh, as well, but yeah, th there's definitely a double-edged sword. Um, the positives and negatives of it taking over your life. Um, and, and you can really have effects on your relationships. Fortunately, uh, my wife, uh, you know, I was very open with her getting into it and I looped her in and she understands the, uh, long-term vision that, that I have for the game and this platform and, industry. I call it an industry and legitimate business. Um, so I look at it as kind of an upstart that, that I'm building and it's, you know, it takes a lot of time in the early stages. I've invested a lot of time, but you know, you, you know, a big payoff of this as well is the relationships that I've been able to build. I never would have expected to have the friendships with some of the people in this community that I, that I have built. You know, I consider a uh, doofy, a very close friend, Jack from good boy racing, uh, Kevin from Arbitrage, uh, Keith from Crimson, the Know Your Horses guys. I mean, I talk to these guys like every single day, like uh, they, they've become almost my closest friends, which uh, is just crazy to say. So um, it's, it is really, it is tough uh, when you, you start to see yourself neglecting other relationships. But like you, you, you said that you kind of like your wife, you, you'd explained it to her. So how do you explain this to like one of your buddies that you didn't really like walk him into this whole process? Like, how are you telling your friends about this game? Cause it's, it's nutty, right? Like, especially when you get into numbers and how much some of these horses are going for, how much you can win in a day. It's nutty when you're telling someone outside of this game, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I have brought friends into the game uh, and I actually, uh, one of my closest friends, like I brought in like, very early. Um, so he, I mean, he's taken a di totally different approach um, to the game and he's in a different place in his life. You know, I think when people ha have families, I don't, I don't have uh, kids or anything. So that gives me a lot more flexibility to, to take some big risks that aren't going to affect, uh, you know, kids right. <laughs> and their future. Um, but yeah, everybody's coming from different angles. Uh, I've brought my brother into the game as well. And we actually have a, a small uh, side project as well, where we own a couple of horses together and, you know, I'll send him horses to, to race them and help me figure out what they are and he'll send them back and we share in any profits and I fund the stable kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, just talking to people that, that aren't necessarily don't have a crypto background. I think that I've actually brought my uncle into the game uh, and he knew nothing about crypto. He was just a big horse racing fan. So I think that it's important to uh, lead with a discussion about crypto in general, uh, especially if you, if you actually think the person will enjoy the game and, and, uh, might, um, want to get in. I think that it's uh, very necessary to give uh, a crypto background about blockchain. Uh, you know, there's a lot of risks involved. It's so easy to make mistakes and lose a lot of money. Uh, security is so important. Um, so I think that that's like the first step. And then once you start to to lay that foundation of explaining that, then you kind of get into, so this is what NFTs are, and this is why I'm excited about this one in particular. And then here's some other use cases and potential utility for, for NFTs and why I think you know tokenizing things has such a, a, a bright future in uh, a lot of different ways and you know kind of go from there. I think once you take that, um, foundation once you build from the bottom up with explaining crypto and then nfts and then zed and then how zed works 
and how you are profiting and, and see it playing out in the future. I think that makes a lot more sense than just jumping in and saying, Hey, digital horse racing, yada, 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 uh, a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> gotcha. No, I like that. And I like that you said that some people come in and they play different games. Some people will come in here and they want to have the best racer. Some people will come in and they just want to have a good time. So for your friends that you get in that want to have a good racer or for the viewers, how much Ethereum do you need to come into this game and be profitable? And what should you go get? You know, I, I happen to see um, on my, I got like a YouTube notification last night or something like that. And um, uh, you had asked uh, Sunny Days this question, and I thought his answer was really good. That um, you know you can find if you know what to look for, and I think that that is that's the hard part. Uh, knowing how to analyze these horses, um, you, you know, <sighs> surrounding yourself with people that understand the game and are open to sharing what they know. Uh, listening to somebody like you um, that has people on that, that understand how to analyze these horses and what is actually profitable, what might be fool's gold. Uh, I think that that's the toughest part for uh, a new person coming in. I mean, there's a lot to learn. There's a very steep learning curve. You don't just want to dive in. I think you got to learn the game first, uh, absorb as much as you can. But there are deals out there. I mean, this is a buyer's market. There's zero doubt about that. There's profitable horses, like Sunny Day said, sitting on the market for 0 0.1, 0 0.15. And you can jump in for that if you know what to look for. Um, and you can have a profitable class three, even class two. Potentially, you hit on a, a class one horse. I mean, Arbitrage sent me one that they bought uh, a couple of days ago for like 0.14 that he thinks is going to be an absolute monster. So uh yeah just just what we need is arbitrage with another monster right they don't stop man every time i wake up like i'll go look at their twitter bio or something it's a new horse in there i'm like god damn it dude <laughs> but yeah to answer your question i don't think you need that much but what you do need is to spend the time learning the game absorbing you know for me you, you don't know what you don't know and uh I always try to surround myself with people that know more than me. I love that. Leverage the community first, especially if there's good people that you can get in contact with that aren't going to try and buy that horse that you're asking about. Yeah, leverage your leverage Twitter. If you can go directly to this person and ask them a question and you look up to them, go do it. They'll most likely they're going to help you and they'll even maybe like give you tips on that horse. Be like, no, that horse is, horse is shit. Go look at this one or something. So leverage the community. There's a lot of good people in this community and a lot of questions that can be answered, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that, um, you know, somebody like me, uh, somebody like Arbitrage, uh, these bigger stable, I mean, we've got reputations to protect at this point. I'm trying to build something big here. I'm trying to build a brand and, uh, you know, my vision for my stable and partnerships that I build is to continue to raise the bar and keep the best racers and sell the next tier down, which will be very valuable assets in other stables and, mm -hmm. and very profitable racers. And I want it to be common knowledge that, hey, he's not selling horses because they don't have value and they're trash, but uh, because, you know, they just, he just doesn't have the time. You know, time is the limiting factor at this point. Uh, I know what, what I can produce and I'm hoping that that becomes common knowledge. So if you consider that, uh, you know, there's no incentive for me to do anything shady and, and betray anyone's trust. And I think there's a lot of stables out there that, that's, that see it that way. I mean, if somebody comes to me and, and, you know, in trust, ask me uh, my opinion on a horse, of course, I'm not going to, you know, turn around and go buy the thing, right. uh, at least not without clearing it with that person right. first, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that is, uh, something if you can get in touch with people, you know, right now my inbox is not too crazy, but you know, I don't want 500 people sending me horses, which right. could happen down the road, you know? Right. Yeah. Not, not saying you, but just in the broader crypto space, a lot of people are going to try and take your money. So like, just always be careful about that and just go to people you trust, go to someone like you, go to sunny days, go to these people that have a reputation that are going to be in this game for a long time. They have no incentive to fuck you over, right? Because yeah, exactly. Everybody wants yeah, I mean, to play this always, game for a long always, time. 
always be skeptical. That's for sure. Don't trust anyone too much. Yeah. Never give out your you secrets. Gotta, you, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you got to come at it from a strategic analytical angle, you know, uh, you know, when I'm looking at owning horses jointly with people, uh, the, the reason I'm comfortable with it, not that I don't trust the people I do, but it's more beneficial for them to work with me. And it's kind of, you know, like crypto in general, Bitcoin was the first to create this, this system, this network where it's more beneficial to work together than to try to, you know, hack it and do something shady. And that's, that's the, the dream here behind all of this. Like if we're working together here and we create a partnership where it's more beneficial for us to be working together than us to try to screw each other, of course, we're going to trust each other. Right. Right. And then, so when you're doing these partnerships, you're getting into like multi-sig wallets and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll share the seed phrase and, um, you know, I, I, I think that that's important that, that both, uh, sides have access to, to be able to see what's going on and, you know, transfer if needed, if something were to happen to the other person. Right. I mean, God forbid that right. that's always a possibility when I've sent horses, valuable horses to other people, the thought has crossed my mind, like, shit, what if, what if he gets in a car accident and I just gave him, you know, a $40,000 horse to, to breed. <laughs> so that thought is always kind of has to be lingering in the mind. Like not that somebody's going to do something shady, but anything can happen in, in life. Anything can happen. Last question for you, man. If you could change one thing in Zed run, Zed run right now, you could bring back odds, take away flame, take away fatigue, whatever you want to do. You could change one thing. What would you change and why? Boy, um, <laughs> without putting a lot of thought in it, I'm sure that there's a better answer that I can give, but, um, I think changing the class system, I mean, they've taken good steps here, but, um, I think that there's still a lot of improvement to be made here on the class system. Um, uh, my huge concern about the way the class system was, and I, I think it's still to be, to be seen how it plays out with the new class points and class system but I still have major concerns about there being a place for new stables uh, to learn the game without being preyed upon by uh, people sandbagging and taking advantage of the system. You know, it's, it's hard to blame anybody for taking advantage of, you know, just like I did with unyielding. It's like, if it's there and you can profit from it, people are going to, and it's hard to blame them for, for doing that. But um, you know, from my point of view, I, I don't, um, sandbag and you know one of the the reasons the for that you know other than me being stupid <laughs> is that i don't want to um i don't want to hurt the growth of the platform i think that that's most important right now is having a safe place for people to to be able to come in and learn the game so i think some sort of tweaks need to be made both to the class system uh class points still and um, you know, maiden races, that type of thing. Uh, horses with less than 5% win rate can only be in these types of races. Create a safe place where you can race against horses that aren't, you know, you get a vanilla bean for the longest time was down there in class four and five. Class one horse just absolutely crushing all of these new players. I don't even want to think about how many users came bought a horse for too much, raced it against vanilla bean, lost their asses and are never coming back. You know, how many people has that happened to? How many more users would there be out there right now? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think that that is, um, you know, probably the, the biggest issue in my eyes is, is creating a safe place for people to learn the game. And, you know, maybe figuring out how to remove some of the steepness from the learning curve. I know that that's kind of on Zed's, Zed's radar and then incentivizing people to race up into class one. You know, I think they've tried to do that. Uh, and I think that there's much more effective ways to do that. Um, I'm sure that that is on the team's radar, you know, it, whether it's creating these, these juiced up prize pools or tournaments for class one only or whatever, but if you can create some incentives to get people to not want to be down in class, uh, you can still leave these, these, then, then these windows can be open. These doors can be open to declassing your horses, but the incentive is greater to move them up into class one. I think that that's the best of both worlds. 
Yeah, that was that was great from top to bottom. Have incentive to not have a vanilla bean in class five, and then have a way for horses to like maybe until you get your first win or like you said five percent win rate you stay in this maiden class you're not going up against these guys that are proven have hundreds of races and are really just sandbagging so i like that you touch from the new guy coming in with a new horse to also the top to where you need to incentivize people to be at the top so they're not down here beating up on people right and i you know i do want to add uh just a, a little bit more i know i know i'm a little bit long-winded here go for it i apologize for that you're good but, um, you know, there's so much animosity when you go into like general and stuff and there's like finger pointing going on of small stables versus big stables and this and that. And what I think I'd like smaller stables to understand is that any intelligent large stable wants the small stables to succeed. We want new users to succeed. We want growth of the platform. I'm not looking to steal anybody's money. I want to take Netflix's money. I want to take these big corporations money that are incentivized to come in and advertise and sponsor these big races. And to get there, we need growth of the platform. And to get there, we need a safe place for smaller stables. We all want the same thing. And I think that that is most important right now is to, to take on this mindset that we're working together here. You know, it's not small stable against big stable and, you know, get rid of this like whiny negative mentality that that's out there. I understand it because there are issues, but that doesn't solve anything, you know, be rational, raise your concerns in a respectful manner and an unbiased manner and try to be careful with the tone that, that we're communicating in, you know, let's, let's work together here. And I think if we, we all are able to start to take on that kind of mindset, we're going to go really far. I agree. So you're going to hop back up in the net, the next Netflix race. If we get it again. Oh, hell yeah, man. I saw your comment that we need a 3.0 because the first two were not legit. <laughs> what, what do you think about I'm that? Would you do that? You like that? Oh yeah, man. I mean, when the, the prize pool is juiced up that much, like, uh, the, the threshold for what you're entering into that race, uh, goes down quite a bit. <laughs> And so if we go to any distance, do you, do you feel like if we switched it up now, do you feel like you have a horse that you could enter at any distance if they go from a thousand to 26? Yeah. I mean, for that first, uh, that the second Netflix race, when they announced it, I had, I created a, a separate stable to, um, well, I, you know, I'll just, I'll just let the cat out of the bag on what I did and, and the way I was looking at it. I created an email stable because I didn't want to have to waste time signing, uh, -huh. uh MetaMask. So if you've got an email stable, uh, you don't have to sign. And I loaded that up with, the uh, you know, $3,000 for the race. And I put two horses in there, uh, triumph for hours for anything 2000 above and shadow for days for anything below 2000. It's pretty convenient having horses that, uh, you know, can run with the best of the best, two horses that can run with the best of the best at all of those distances. It kind of makes it a little bit easier. Uh, so yeah, no matter the distance, I will be trying to get in any of those races. And then, you know, arbitrage and I have, uh, horses for every single distance too. Now with, uh, Festus, Ray Del Mundo and, uh, um, Evergreen Gates. I don't know that we have a 1400 meter horse. I don't know that I'm comfortable. Uh, we've, we've kind of been discussing this. If there's a, even a $500 entry, I don't know that we're going to be putting Ray Del Mundo in at 1400, but other than that, every single distance, I probably have two horses in. Those races are crazy, huh? I mean, that's what makes you realize that Zed is going to be big is once you're in a race like that, the heart racing, the shaking, the sweating is intense, right? Yeah, I mean, I wish that there was a little bit more buildup, you know, especially, I mean, at least the second one, I guess we had the advance notice, but still, you know, leave us some time between the filling and the scheduling for everybody to hype it up and let us at least enjoy that we've got a chance. <laughs> it's like five minutes and it's over and we lost, right? right. But at least, hey, at least you podium, right? Yeah, I mean, I almost, they almost caught me, but uh, I was very I was very happy yesterday when they came out and they said that they'd right everybody's wrongs. GVG's technically going to get third. Crimson will technically get third, and then I technically got second. So no complaints. Yeah. I'm glad that they righted that wrong. They fixed it, and then hopefully maybe we can run it back with a Redwood 3.0 with no Sentinel. Absolutely. You know, I suggested maybe we rerun all those tournament races with who should have been uh, in there instead of Sentinel. Uh, mm. Guessing that's probably not going to happen, but I don't know that it would be that hard. I would have had uh, 
in the inaugural tournament, unyielding finished fourth in the semifinal and Sentinel took second in that race. So he would have advanced to the final and he's like 80% uh, to finish in the top four in that next race and make the grand final, which mm. that stings looking back, but you know, Hey, we go forward, not back. Right. Right. We're going forward. Well, all right, man. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, I don't think I do, man. Uh, I, I guess, can you leave diamonds out of uh, my races? Is, is that cool? I don't know, man. I think, uh, you've stuck me a few times, so I, I got to come back for my money, man. You got, got me. I, I think you're going to do just fine in the long run. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm hoping. I'm still trying to figure out how to race these U-shaped horses. Like, um, I talked to Arbitrage yesterday, and he says he thinks everyone's individual. And me, personally, I kind of look at it as, like, card counting. If I've got a lot of 12s, maybe I've got a lot of 1s on the way. I'm not too sure how to how to balance my bankroll, but I'm trying, you know? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. I think they have to be independent. But there's also some sort of universal law that that works uh, that, um, you know, there's just streakiness in the universe everywhere you look at it. Things things happen in a peculiar way. And, um, you know, I think that that's built into their algorithm, but I think it just naturally happens in the universe that horses are streaky. Uh, but I do think I mean, it's like you flip a coin, mm -hmm. if you flip it uh, 10 times and they're all heads. The, the next one is just as likely to be heads or tails, right? Mm -hmm. But that streak happened and you can't deny it. No, I got you. Yeah, I'll stop I'll stop tossing diamonds into your races when you stop breeding killers on us. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, man. Where Fair can, enough. Uh, where can people catch your content at? Con or where can people co follow you at and catch your content at? Because I see that you're with Doofy on uh, – you guys do auctions on Twitch. Yeah, we were doing the auctions and I think we, we intend to, I know we intend to start them back up, but, um, you know, the market was so down and it just, we brought in, uh, the last time I think we did two, like six horse auctions, two of them were our own. And we always throw our own in at no reserve at this point. Um, because you know, we're going to see what the market says they're worth. Uh, but we had, uh, I think we had one other no reserve horse and it went for so low, uh, that we didn't feel right um continuing on in this current ecosystem until the market picks up a little bit so yeah we're hoping to, to start those auctions back up on doofy's twitch stream which is doofy racing uh at some point and you know we're open to auctioning i mean we are auctioning community horses uh, we take a five percent cut which is the same as as open um we do as best a job as we can at uh, presenting an unbiased argument both the positives and negatives of of each horse and you know, we're going to try to, to give it the best sales pitch that we can to, to incentivize people to bring them to us, but we're also going to highlight the, the negatives there. So yeah, keep an eye out for those. I'm on uh, Twitter, obviously at Z diamond hands. Uh, you can follow me there. Hit me up there with questions. I don't even know what my discord is, but uh, you can find it. <laughs> it it's out, out there. Um, just search me on there, but yeah, you know, I am doing the fantasy sports over at rasball.com. People can find me over there too. Right. If you're into fantasy football, fantasy baseball, anything like that. Sweet man. And then, uh, if I have a horse, I want to auction, how can I get in contact with you guys to, to potentially put it up in the auction house when you guys come back? Is it just Twitter? Yeah. So yeah, we have a, uh, we have a Google form, uh, out there that you can submit and kind of give your sales pitch and give us the information on the horse. And then we'll get in contact which um, I'll post it up there uh, on my Twitter account and as well Doofy when we start it back up and we are taking submissions. But I think uh, for now, until we know when the next auction date is actually going to be, uh, we're just going to put it on hold and, and we'll see. Doofy's a busy man. So um, kind of scheduling there and then the market, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. I mean, you know, time, as I said, is a limiting factor for all of us in this game. 100%. Well, DT... Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate your time. There was a lot to learn. I'm sure the viewers learned a lot, and I learned a lot myself. So thank you so much, man. Heck yeah, man. Uh, great talking to you, and uh, happy to, to come back anytime. Likewise, man. Yeah, I'll have you back on anytime. Have a good weekend. You too.